Good evening, one and all, and welcome to the stream. I'm Alistair, and eight feet to my left is the Luminous Marguerite. Well, they can't tell I'm luminous if I'm not on camera. Where's the lighting coming from if it's not from you? Aww, oh, that's very sweet of you to say. I love you. Mm. I love you. Show everybody your amazing nude polo t-shirt. Uh, I am rocking my <laughs> The Secret of St. Kilda polo shirt. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. with The Secret of St. Kilda is I'm fashionable. <laughs> It is. Yes. Uh, welcome to the show, new friends and old. Those of you who've been here before, you know the drill. But we're going to keep it real um, tweet. And keep tell it real, yo. Keep it real, yo. Uh, far, far too manx for that. I was reminded by a friend on Twitter. Far too manx for what? Uh, that kind of hand action. Yeah, probably not so Rem much. I was reminded today by a friend on Twitter of the existence of the only car ever designed on the Isle of Man. It has no rear gear. It does not go in reverse. Well, of course not. It's faster to just drive around the rest of the island. It's only the, like, what, 40 there kilometers? There is a handle on the back, and you just carry it around. Was this designed by Homer Simpson? Yes. Okay. Possibly. Uh -huh. It's still being built, too. No. I, yes. just, I disbelieve. In London. I think we're going to have to go and see this thing. I think we probably should. Anyway, this is... <laughs> but I the... digress. This is how the show normally goes. We, we get broken up into three different parts. There's a lot of nonsense. There's a lot of nonsense. The nonsense is kind of the foundation. It's kind of the team structure. <coughs> There's an opening monologue, which is your excuse to get comfortable, uh, get hydrated, get your pets fed, take any meds you might need, get some food, get comfortable, all that good stuff. Yeah, mix and kill that. I hear it's very good. There's some very good people there. Um, all sorts of really good people yes, there, I hear. Yes, yes, indeed. We should talk some more about that in a little bit. Uh, and then after the opening monologue, we will show you what Chungus is wearing this week. Um, and then we'll dive into the next section of Nine Goblins, our current novella by T. <gasps> Kingfisher. I've just realized. Okay, first of all, show everybody what Chungus is wearing this week, and then I just realized that Chungus might Chungus. need a St. Kilda t-shirt, and how am I going to make that happen? Please observe Chungus in full Martin kit, in full Martin kit, kit with his little poetry notebook and his little mug. Oh, his adorable little mug. Um, the little uh, knot tee is around somewhere, but Wendy, I think the knot tee needs to be on a magnet like Peter's hat was, because it would make it a lot easier to not lose it in the giant vat of Chungus costumes. But yeah, I gotta figure out how to do a St. Kilda costume for Chungus. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Thank you, Wendy. I will definitely have to give that some thought. They do baby clothes, right? Yeah. Worst case scenario, we could do a sticker or a little baby onesie. See, anytime either one of us uses that tone of voice, I'm reminded of a moment from a film I'm fairly certain only I have seen. In the twilight days of his movie career, Steve Martin was responsible, some would say perpetrated, uh, a remake of the classic Phil Silver sitcom, Sergeant Bilko. There are <coughs> two genuinely brilliant jokes in the movie. The one which has stuck in my mind is where he's just spitballing ideas for making money and he suggests turning the motor pool into a crash. And uh, one of the others goes, are you sure it's safe, Sarge? And like, of course it is. They won't die. That could be the slogan. Bill goes crash. They won't die. And you know how some things just stick in your mind? That stuck in my mind. Wow. You're welcome. The sourdough of St. Kilda. <sighs> that can totally happen oh it can <gasps> i want a kilt i want a kilt for chungus stuart family kilt i bet we have enough fabric left over for when we had your kilt made yes. that we could make a <gasps> the magic is starting early tonight everybody pardon me i need to take some notes Anyway, fantastic uh, opening fan art this week, Peter Lucas, but he hates hairdressers, by Nexal Art, which is wonderful, and like so many of you, has given me hair envy. For back when I... Really? Had it. <laughs> You're giving a hair envy joke? <laughs> There's the thumbnail for... T do that again. That, that what is you like... going to do? There we go, Ducky. There's our thumbnail for what tonight. What you going to do? Exactly. <clears throat> Should we do the opening monologue? Uh, what? I'm sorry, I'm distracted by Chungus and a kilt. Shall we do the opening monologue? Yes, we should do the opening monologue. Here we go. Then again, I said the word kilt, so I was distracted. Just in general. How about an opening monologue? 
Anyway, welcome this is going to gonna be a bad one, folks. I'm sorry. Um, the opening monologue this week comes, as it so frequently does, from Nate, uh, Nate Crowley, our personal house band. Uh, video game journalist, video game writer, Warhammer 40,000 writer, creator of probably the best zombie novel uh, novellas I've ever read. Nate is is the business. And yeah, um, I've already read this once, and I don't think the corpse count is going to drop appreciably at all. <coughs> Total War Warhammer 3 brings tower defense, boss fights, and lakes of sick to Total War. I like it very much. Great. You you got a corpse in the title? Oh, no. Wendy, start your engines. Oh, she, she's underway. Tower defense and Total War are not, you might think, two tastes that go particularly well together. You'd be surprised. Last month, I got to play one of the set-piece battles from Total War Warhammer 3, which are an army of furious fantasy Slavs battling to fortify a toehold in their invasion of hell. There were barricades built, hordes of devil dogs wiped out by AI-controlled magic spaffing turrets, a gigantic polar bear made out of moss and dirt. You know, normal, reasonable things, and it was bloody wonderful. Does spaffing mean what I'm afraid yes, it might mean? Yes, it does. Mean? Yes. Okay. It, it's Content from... warning for this. Bodily fluids mention. Violence and war. Apologies, we didn't get to those ahead of that time. That was entirely on me. My apologies. It's okay. Yes. Uh, I, there, there are party games I should never tell you about. <coughs> it was interesting, you know, seeing your reactions to last month's remaster of Total War Rome, a game originally released during actual Roman times when centurions walked the earth. I learned there were more people than I thought for whom the entire Total War experience peaked in those long ago days of the early 2000s. To those grown-ups, and I use the term with respect, even though it sounds like a medical term for dying pirates, the series' main strength was always its commitment to realism. Things started going downhill with the advent of faster battles in Shogun 2, whenever it was that armies of men learned to transform into boats at will rather than be forced to load into separate naval units. I doubt it will be a surprise to such traditionalists if I say that Total Warhammer 3 is not going to be the game for them. You know, even more than Total Ham Warmers 1 and 2 were not for them, because this game frankly looks bonkers, and coming from me that is both a considered and unambiguous statement of praise. This, this series has always been an exercise in extravagance, after all, in line with Games Workshop's typically maximalist take on fantasy. The number of factions introduced over five years, two games, and a relentless flood of DLC has reached the point where few humans alive could conceivably have played a campaign as all of them. The variety of units, spells, and special mechanics involved is dizzying, and such is the bulk of the Mortal Empires campaign, which stitches together the first two games in their entirety, that entire civilizations can remain semi-broken for years, submerged in a deep sea of other things to do. But TWW3 will simply not be a third bucket of sausages tipped into this already groaning wheelbarrow of meat. There's your gender for the week. Groaning wheelbarrow of meat. In the words of lead battle designer Jim Whitstone, Creative Assembly want to go out with a bang on their fantasy extravaganza, pushing the man who turns into a boat out in every aspect of the game. And so we come to the bit of it I played, in which the forces of Kislev, who are a bit Russian, a bit Polish, and a whole lot extrapolated from a middling presence in the tabletop game, have broken through the barriers of reality itself in order to invade the realms of chaos. Realm of Chaos, or rather, the Realms of Chaos. I read those books. Because, hey, why have one hell when you could have four? This realm belongs to Korn, the god of <laughs> pub car, car park fistfights. And <laughs> bad wannabe metal? <laughs> yeah. And consequently, it is an eye-pummeling wasteland of flames and gore, strewn with brutal monoliths of red iron and vast blood-jundering skulls. <laughs> <coughs> Are you okay? That was a 6.7, Wendy. Oh, are we counting? Yeah. Yeah, we had a little bit of buffering going on for a moment here, but hopefully things I'm have... massively in the red over here, but... No, uh, no. But we're only dropping 7.1% of frames, so... Okay, things should hopefully be catching up soon. I don't think it's us, I think it's Twitch. It's so much richer and, uh, and busier than any battlefield I've total warred on before. And I'm curious to see its sister locations in the realms of Zinch, bird-faced god of shitposting... <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. Can you say that word again? Zinch. Is it T Z? E E N T C H. Isn't it Samish? 
No, that would involve I's and C's having blackout sex. This is Warhammer, a right? Dumpster, yes. Zamish! That there's no way that's a Zamish. It is Zamish! There's no M, there's an N. <sighs> oh my gosh, we're gonna have to have Warhammer Wars now. Let's move on quickly. If if the chat wanted to come up with a ruling on how you pronounce Zich or Zamish, <laughs> then please do. Uh, Slanesh, the artist formerly known as Captain Sex. Really? I am twelve. <coughs> a Nurgle, the master of binges. I, I, I'm sorry, what? <sighs> Nurgle, I'm, the master uh, of... And Nurgle, the master of bin juice. <laughs> Ew. In the realm of Nurgle, a force game designer James Martin to admit, has actual realm lakes of sick. It's a far cry from Rome's tall grass and forest terrain, isn't it? Anyway... <coughs> the brave lads and lasses of Kislev have invaded the place under the leadership of Queen Catherine, who's like a metal version of Elsa off of Frozen, and who has a hot bar packed with extremely powerful ice spells. They are faced with a new survival battle type, in which their mission is to seize and hold three capture points. Each of these points provides a battlefield-wide buff for whoever holds it, is guarded by a swarm of demons, and is placed accessibly deeper inside the uh, stronghold of the Blood God. <laughs> What's like more, the brave, not quite Russians, can't just fight and move on. Once taken, each point must be held against a massive initial counterattack, coming from every direction at once, and then a permanent trickle of infernal bastards from the map's edge. Oh, and then they have to fight a gigantic flying Satan, aka the greater demon Bloodthirster, in order to win the day. As you can imagine, this is all way in excess of the level of opposition one would face in even the most pitched endgame battle of Total Warhammer 2. Even the counterattack at the first capture point made my mouth fall open a little bit, like the bloke at Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings when they see the thousands of Christopher Lee's beefiest boys wading towards them down a canyon. Meat back <coughs> on the menu, boys! Luckily, however... <coughs> <coughs> Luckily, however, you are not expected to manage all of this with the strong but inconveniently finite force of troops you start with. At each counterpoint, you gain control of a portal through which reinforcements can be summoned, as well as a number of hard points where either towers or barricades can be constructed. As the third string to this bow, you can perform mid-battle upgrades to any of your individual units, beefing up their attack, armor or shield values, healing them or giving them a really encouraging team talk. All of these activities have a cost in supply, a generic token resource, and through killing devils and maintaining control of capture points. The game is pretty generous with the amount it allots you, and yet, at the same time, it's never enough to make you feel like you're doing more than clinging on by your fingertips against the horde. Hard decisions must be made. Do you spring for the big lad magic turrets to whittle down incoming swarms, or crank up the murder score on your shock cavalry in order to get the job done up close? Do you build unscalable walls and usher cheap battalions of archers into the blood zone to fire volleys over them? Or do you erect cheaper, lower barricades and spend the leftover money on riflemen to line the parapets? If it makes it easier to decide, I should mention that the riflemen's guns are also axes. Really? Yes. Weird. Not like rifles with... Pikes on <coughs> or bayonets on the end? No, like the World War Z anti Z tool, just with a rifle on the end of it. You know, for kids. Yeah. Okay. Sober historical battle simulation, this is not. It's a pitched, overwhelming, relentless brawl, which gives the exact sensation of budget rinsing, too much to take in madness, one expects to find at the back end of an incomprehensible summer blockbuster. And there, I suppose, is the one sticking point I found with this battle. It was genuinely too much for my mind to take in. Balancing unit orders and hero ability micromanagement across a single front is taxing enough. Add in a management and construction metagame, however, as well as three big fights with 360 degree fronts happening simultaneously and you get a real headache brewing. It's just too much cognitive load. I'm not bad at Total War and can usually command a battle as it plays out in standard speed. But here I spent probably 80% of my time in the viscous, muted confines of slow-mo mode and the lion's share of the remainder paused entirely. I felt a little sad having to de-immerse myself from such a gorgeously kinetic, violent environment, and at times it felt as if I was having to play an RTS as a turn-based game, just to keep track of it. With all that said, these apocalyptic beastings will not be the norm in TWW3. 
Whitstone made it very clear that the survival battles will be exceptional landmark events, placed at climactic events in points, pardon me, in the faction campaigns where they rightly belong. What I really like, too, is that they'll be playable in isolation from the main menu, with players able to choose any combination of faction, chaos realm, and reinforcement rosters to play with. For the first time, too, there will be co-op functionality. So if you and your best mate want to send the lost alliance of orcs and ratmen on a desperate assault on the kingdom of Sick, Total War Warhammer 3 can make that dream come true. Indeed, when I asked Martin about this, he told me that up to four players could take on a survival battle together, so one player could focus on defense, one on pushing forwards, and so on. This preview event was, perhaps reasonably, focused entirely on showcasing the new battle mode, but there's clear implications of the rest of the game here. Whitstone agreed that it would be reasonable for me to suppose, for example, that all the customizable towers and barricades featured seemed an obvious carryover from a complete reworking of sieges, which have always been the Total Warhammer series' notable weak spot. Given it was also announced that minor settlement battlements, previously indistinguishable from field battles, were being reworked, a farewell to samey urban warfare seems to be on the cards too. There was also some talk about another new battle mode, ominously referred to only as domination. I didn't find out much about domination battles other than the fact that they, like the survival battles I played, supported multiplayer participation. Fingers crossed I'll know more about that soon. Did the survival battle feel over the, mode feel over the top? Even arcadey? Yeah, 100%. But crucially, it also felt exactly in line with everything that's made me sink hundreds of hours into the TW games up to this point. Not to put too fine a point on it, I'm coming to this party because I want to get smashed. And it doesn't look like I'll be disappointed. Every time somebody <coughs> says not to put too fine a point on it, my brain immediately goes Say to, I'm the only bee in your I'm bonnet. Say I'm the only bee in your bonnet. Yeah, exactly. I am that old. I am... They might be giants old. You, you, are, you are perfect old. That's how old you are. <laughs> oh, that's very sweet of you. That, that was a heck of a game description. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. really was almost good enough to make me want to play it. Almost. Almost. Uh, I, something about the land of sick, kind of. No. God of bin juice. God of bin juice. I don't want to be vintage. Vintage has a specific number of years associated with it. That's scary. Oh. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Shall we talk about what's new with you this week? Yeah. <clears throat> she says. Highlighting your t-shirt yet again. Ta-da! Um, my The Secret of St. Kilda merchandise has arrived, which is lovely, and it's all really, really good stuff. <coughs> um, I'm very hesitant to talk about the show in detail, largely because my boss is in, in the chat. <laughs> um, Hi, Mick! But I, I've read the script, and oh boy. You, you, you know that, that horrible, uh, hoary old cliche about you know, this is your new favourite podcast? Guess what? This is your new favourite podcast. This thing unfolds like nothing I've seen. And uh, I've got a really, really fun part in it. And it is enabling me to do something with my vocal work I've not done before. And actually to confront one of the many facets of my total lack of professional self-confidence. I am fairly convinced that I have absolutely no range. You know, I, I can do relatively convincing Cockney. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, could you remind the chat how many different characters you will be voicing this evening? Seven. Plus? Plus. Okay. You know, I, I've got some decent accents on me. Apparently my Bristolian is note perfect, which I'm really pleased about, because that's fucking hard. Um, <coughs> but... <coughs> I've always kind of felt that my range is is very much in, you know, jovial early forties nerd. I, I I am very much like my my idol, like my my older brother from another mother, Mister Rollins. You know, I'm just like I do a thing, and I'm going to audition for you. And if the thing I do is happens to be what you're looking for, that's great. But if you're looking for something I can't do, I do a thing. Okay, you're not Nick Cage. You're better than Nicolas Cage, honey. He's saying I'm not, in fact, a sexy cat. I'm not I'm even cat. going down sexy that. Sexy cat. I'm not going down that road at all. Anyway. Um, but this is actually really helping me confront that because we figured out what this character is. Vocally. Don't say. I'm not going to say at all. 
I'm not going to spoil anything about who I'm playing, but tonally, the read I've got on him is delicious and enables me to do something I have never had an opportunity to do before. Needless uh, to say, we are having a lot of fun preparing for um, upcoming table reads now, aren't we? Yes, yes. I'm super excited about that. So that's going well. Um, what else is going on this week? Did I mention my favorite West Wing episode is Celestial Would Navigation? Would you please stop? Um, one of the two books I can't talk about, I've broken ground on, uh, which is fine. It's it's not good ground, but it's ground. I've got about three weeks to finish it. It's, it's 40,000 words, so it's going to be difficult. But I'll get it done. Um, the other one is looking like it's going to slot into a, just a, frankly, ridiculously civilized part of my schedule which is just great and my co-creator and after the war the the tabletop rpg which i um i co-created oh hold on a second i think there's a copy in the room hold on there, might, there is oh yes thank you Outside is very excited about their motorcycle. What are you doing? I wanted to make a note of a thing for the the show notes. You're making a note here. Checking it twice. Huge success. Yes. Please pardon Alistair while he drafts the note. <laughs> What's happening with me? Not telling. Can't tell. Yeah. Um. Well, we got some things done this week, which was really nice. Yes. We got all the Hugo packet stuff done and turned in and which those is will great be, and and it's a lot of work those um, will be live hopefully shortly which will be nice but yes um my co-creator and after the war has come back to me and i've got about ten thousand more words there which is brilliant and is also it's the stuff i'm really good at uh when it comes to rpg design i am spotty when it comes to mechanics i i'm i'm a world guy I do thoughts and feelings. You're and not concepts. spotty. It's just not your strength. <clears throat> and one of the things I love the most about After the War is that we've got this incredibly complex background in there, which very quietly, if you look at, at it the right way, means you can play the game in any one of four different time scales. One of which is 1977 on Earth. Um, and he's basically gone all this really interesting background you've got. Yeah, give me ten thousand more words on it. <laughs> like. Great. Also means I now have to reread the timeline and make sure I haven't contradicted myself. Uh, because I, I, I almost did that a couple of times before. Oh, but knows. if I'm right, then this means that I have an opportunity to pay homage to my favorite astronomical monument, which unfortunately collapsed recently, the Arecibo Radio Telescope. Uh, and I can put a, a fairly plot vital moment there without too much difficulty. Um, That'll be fun. Yes. So um, the other thing we should probably talk... Oh, we'll talk at the end of the stream about what we got coming up, hopefully, next week. No, 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 we're not. Nah. All right. Basically, I had to yawn. Nice vamp. Okay, I'm glad I covered that so professionally and well. <laughs> nope. Nobody's even going to notice, right? It's fine. No exactly. one noticed. What do you think? You ready to start reading us a story? You want to hear about some goblins? Let's get ready for some goblins. Let's get ready to gobble. So, real quick, really, that was fun. I know the lyrics to the rap. You should count yourself very lucky I'm not reciting them. Just don't. Just don't. All right, so just as a warning for everybody, um, I'm going to put the link in the chat to where you can find the amazing book from T. Kingfisher. Amazing. We also have some content warnings this evening. Yes, we do. They are horror themes, mental health, and trauma. Violence, fainted unconscious character, poison oak, travel through enemy territory. And I'm going to throw maybe low level persistent battle stress in there as well. Yeah, something kind of like that. The other thing, uh, Wendy has put together <coughs> a dramatis personae for us. So if you are having difficulty reminding yourself about our varied and sundry cast of characters, you can check out the link and get some nice reminders. And I absolutely uh, promise you, Wendy's is much better laid out than mine. And, this is and, my language cheat sheet. Should we add in your accent notes at some point oh they're in there no i meant to the document so people i would see be ha I'd be delighted to put people that can guess that would be fun um and wendy will be updating that as we go along 
So, <coughs> with all that said... <coughs> Let's read this, shall we? Seven, go seven goblins going well. I'll go out and come back in. Uh, Nine Goblins by T. Kingfisher. Chapter 7. Nasilka had been in any number of battles, and she couldn't remember the first ten minutes of any of them. She had a theory that if you could remember the first ten minutes, you'd never, ever charge at anybody again, so parts of your brain blotted them out. The problem with that was the problem was that she couldn't imagine why her brain would want her to continue charging at people, and this then led her to the theory that parts of her brain worked for the Goblin High Command, and she did not like that at all. Regardless, it was ten minutes into the battle, and she couldn't remember what had just happened. There had been a lot of yelling. Everyone yelled. No matter what species you were, elf, human, goblin, orc, random bystander, you yelled. There had been a lot of hitting things. Her shield was bent in four or five places, and her arms ached dreadfully. Algol went by at high speed, shield raised, with Mishkin and Mushkin practically stepping on his heels. Mishkin had gotten a sword from somewhere and was waving it dangerously close to Algol's kidneys. She had no idea how the battle was going. But she didn't seem to be dead, so from her perspective, everything was really going rather well. Unfortunately, Sergeant Nasilka had just seen a problem. The problem stood on a little rise, just enough to lift him out of the battle proper. He looked human. He wasn't wearing armour or carrying weapons, but he was doing something with his hands. And there was a blueness in the air around him. Not really a blue light, per se, but the world around him was turning shades of blue, like something behind a pane of cobalt glass. That wasn't right. That was magic, that was. A bolt of blueness streaked out from his suddenly open mouth and hit a knot of goblins who fell down. Oh, hell, Nasilka thought. It's a wizard. All wizards are crazy. Not the quaint colloquial crazy, where you have an offbeat sense of humour and wear brightly coloured socks, don't... Mild eccentricity coupled with a general lack of fashion sense. Not, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. Wizards aren't weird. They are genuinely, legitimately around the bend. This is because magic is a form of psychosis. Forget the bearded men wearing robes covered in stars trying to sell you bargain spell books. Nine times out of ten, it's a scam. The tenth time, they really can do magic, but it's not something they can teach you. Various parties have done intensive studies of Arcane Manifestation Disorder, or as it's called, AMD, and the results often make for interesting reading, but they still don't know what causes someone to have a sudden psychotic break and wake up able to throw fire from their fingertips. It just happens. There are basically two kinds of sufferers of AMD, the high-functioning and the rather less so. High-functioning wizards can live on their own, and while they tend to be shy and awkward in social situations, meticulously neat, easily startled, they're not any worse off than the rest of us. The more unfortunate wizards generally require someone to dress them and should not be allowed near sharp objects. By its very nature, magic is highly complex and highly individualised. It's hard to say what magic can and can't do, because it varies so wildly between wizards. Some of them are battle machines, some of them are good in the garden. Some do weather. Some of them can, on a good day, turn a mushroom into a hedgehog, and some of them can shatter mountains. There's a young woman in East Charing who can't talk, but can heal just about anything that ails you. You, you, you just don't know. Because of this unpredictability, basically nobody relies on magic. People have tried, but you get a lot of very unhappy wizards, and they are not a group you want to make unhappy. While individuals with AMD often find work suited to their own particular talents, the only large institutions with a policy of employing wizards en masse are armies. Sergeant Nasilka had been in the Goblin Army since she was old enough to lie about being old enough to be in the Goblin Army, and she had encountered a fair number of enemy wizards. There had been the one who shot smothering clouds of butterflies out of his fingertips, 
and the one who made people's skeletons shuck off their bodies, like someone taking off a heavy coat, and the really creepy one who made people just go away. This guy... This guy shot blue out of his mouth. The Silker had never seen anybody shoot blue from their mouths, but the goblins had been hit. They, they weren't getting up again, and that was more than enough for her. It's a wizard! Get the wizard! Somebody was yelling. Follow me, quick! <coughs> After, oh, I've actually bulls that up. Pardon me. It's a wizard! Get the wizard! Somebody was yelling. Follow me, quick! After a minute of this, the Silka realized she was the one doing the yelling and cursed her traitorous vocal cords of all the body parts to suddenly discover patriotism. Then her feet appeared to discover it as well because she seemed to be charging the wizard. Why, feet? Why now? Why can't you be more like, oh, oh, the spleen, you say? The spleen never charges anybody. Great. Her feet ignored her. Her vocal cords appeared to have gotten the hint because she at least wasn't yelling anymore, or perhaps her blood was just pounding in her ears too loudly to tell. She wondered if anybody was actually following her. Not daring to look behind her for fear of finding that she was making a suicide charge all on her own, she continued forward. The ground slipped and slid and squelched under her broad feet. At this stage of the fight, footing was often more dangerous than the other chap having a sword. All those feet running and jumping and tearing over the hillside had uh, churned it into dirt and mud and slippery bits. If you fell down, you slid until you hit somebody else. A dead body if you were very lucky. A live, angry body carrying a blunt instrument if you weren't. Goblins actually have an advantage in this terrain since their feet are so huge, but there are limits. She tripped over something, goodness I hope that wasn't what it looked like, and stumbled down the slope, not entirely in control of her own course. An elf appeared in front of her. He had a sword. Unable to stop, and for lack of anything better to do, she ran directly into him at full speed. He squawked and went down. So did she. Overhead, another bolt of blue shot out and dropped a nearby goblin like a rock. Sometimes, whoever gets up first wins. And since Nasilka was sitting on the elf's legs, she had a tenuous advantage. The elf kicked and bucked under her. She slammed a club down on his knee and put a stop to that, rolled to her feet, took aim and stomped hard. Now... Male elves are no different from any other humanoid species in some regards. He probably wouldn't die. But he would certainly wish he did. And Nasilka didn't have time to stick around with the wizard still spitting bolts of blue everywhere. So she slid and squelched forwards and then she got onto a patch that somehow still had grass on it. Oh glory. And got traction and pounded forwards. She was 20 feet away, and it occurred to her that her entire plan was hit wizard with club, hope for the best. Uh, this wasn't a bad plan, as, as such things go, but it did not seem to have a contingency for the wizard spitting blueness at her. There were footsteps behind her. Somebody yelled. The wizard looked up and his eyes went wide. The silka had to do it. She darted a glance behind her. The entire 19th, from Al Gold and to Blanchett's teddy bear, were right there. Shock ward with gratitude, ward with the horror that she was going to get them all killed. Nazilka left her emotions to sort the matter out on their own time, raised her club and thundered up the last few feet to the wizard. Whoa! The wizard stopped shooting blue. His mouth opened again, and this time in what looked like a cry of terror, and he reached both hands to one side and grabbed at thin air. Nasilka wondered if he'd gone mad with terror, or if he was trying to milk an invisible cow. Then, and even for magic, this was bloody weird. He grabbed the air and yanked. The air tore open, really tore, as if it were a big sheet of canvas with the world painted on it, and there was something on the other side. Darkness. Darkness shot with green. That moved. Sergeant Nasilka did not know much about magic, but she was pretty sure that tearing holes in the air meant no good for anybody. She tried to stop. The 19th Infantry, infantry led by Algol, crashed directly into her. 
Her feet went out from under her and she crashed into the wizard, who in turn crashed into the hole in the air. The hole went glorp. The wizard went, ah! The silga went, oh crap. Algol went, Sarge? And the world went black. Soon we will have a emoji for this. Chapter 8. <coughs> Sings to Trees was tired, but he felt good. This was his normal state of being, so he didn't stop to notice it. The bone doe, now with a splint and a tightly wrapped cast, had melted into the trees, followed by her brooding companion. The stag hadn't liked him messing around with the doe's leg, and had rattled near constantly, like a furious rattlesnake, till the doe had turned her head and snapped her exposed teeth in the stag's, di stag's direction. Sings to Trees gazed off in the middle distance with a vague, pleasant expression, the way most people do when present at other people's minor domestic disputes, and after a moment the stag had stopped rattling and the doe would turn back and rested her chin trustingly on Sings to Trees' shoulder. This would have been a touching gesture, but for the fact that her chin was made of painfully pointy plates of bone. It was a little bit like being snuggled by an affectionate plough. <coughs> That's totally tonight's gender. But the leg had gotten splinted and wrapped, and the doe was walking more easily already, and beyond that, it was in the hands of whatever gods looked after the articulated skeletons of deer. So he pulled on the rusted handle of his pump until water gushed out. He washed his hands and then plunged his whole head briefly under it. Refreshed and spluttering, he headed back up to the farmhouse to look something up. Sings to Trees, while not having many fragile things, did own a small library, which he kept locked in a cedar chest for safekeeping. One look at the outside of the chest, scorched by fire, scored by claws, chewed by teeth, and some kind of acid had etched a random design in the lid, made it obvious why something as fragile as paper was on the inside. He had several herbals, full of small, neat drawings of plants and careful notes, two of which he'd written himself. He had a Sleestack's Guide to Common Farmyard Maladies and Diseases of the Goat. It was amazing how many of those showed up in Trolls. And the Good Elves' Almanac, which contained many, many E's and very little useful information. And of course, the exhaustive Herbal Remedies, which were six inches thick and full of bookmarks. He even had a dog-eared copy of Medica Magica, which was full of outright lies and falsehoods, but every now and then had something worth paying attention to. The book he really wanted was near the bottom. It sings to trees dug down, pulling up precarious stacks of leather bindings on either side of the trunk, until he found the volume and lifted it into the light. The silver leaf had long since flaked off the cover, and the letters had become a series of flat spaces in a sea of tooled leather, read as much with the hand as the eye. In the language of humans, it read, Bestiary. The elf sat down and began, carefully, turning pages. There was no index. The author had been a wizard, and had been doing well to hold it together long enough to write the descriptions, which were rambling in places and painfully abrupt in others when they weren't downright insane. There were no chapters, there was nothing resembling alphabetical order. The entries showed up where they showed up, and given the nature of some of the comments and dispersing the text, the reader was generally grateful to get that much. The pictures, though, the pictures practically moved on the page. Even in scratchy black and white, they shone like little gems. The elegant neck of the unicorn flexed, the serpentine mane of the catoblopas writhed, muscles pulsed in the shoulders of the great bull. Magic may have been involved. Sings to trees rather thought that the author's gift had been visions, because the creatures gave every evidence of being drawn from life, and in some cases, like the kraken or the ice moles, that would have been quite a feat. He was two-thirds of the way through the book, scrutinising each illustration carefully before he saw it. The carefully articulated skeleton of a stag gazed back at him from the page. The Cervidine, or Cervidian, does range, range widely through the world, being in all ways like unto a true deer, 
saying that it be made of bones and not of flesh. Why for are you poking at me? Stop! Stop, I implore you! The Savidian reproduces by manner unknown, though it is said that they may build a fawn of bones and so imbue it with essential life. The poking to cease! To cease! But I have not been witness to this, and consider it may be folly. It is known the Savidian is much fond of magic and very curious, like unto a magpie, and will oft be found in areas of great mystical disturbance, which perhaps it may eat, for it take no sustenance of grass. I will become angry if there is more poking, and only damps its bones in water and dew. Why do you not stop? It went on in that vein for quite a while, and by the time the author had gotten control of himself again, he was talking about the limerick contests held by Manticores. Sings the trees closed the book thoughtfully, of course, just because the Savidian was attracted by magical disturbance. It didn't follow that there was one happening nearby. But it was still... interesting. He hadn't seen such a creature in all the years he'd been out here. He should probably send a pigeon to the rangers and asked him if anything weird was happening. There was an almighty crash from the hearth, and Sings bolted to his feet. <coughs> the raccoon had learned how to open the hutch, and had celebrated its newfound freedom by knocking the hutch over, along with the iron fire grate, and the tea kettle that had been warming there. It sat in the midst of the wreckage, paused clasped in glee, and greeted Sings to trees with a happy clarp. The elf sighed. He had enough trouble without borrowing more, so he scooped up the raccoon cub, rescued the kettle, and began put putting books away before his patient got any more bright ideas. The sergeant's head hurt. Somebody was singing under their breath, thumper again, probably, with a whack, whack, hit. Oh, God, her head hurt. She wanted to go back to sleep. Sleep was, was, was really good. Sarge. Oh God, they wanted us to wake up. Sarge. Sarge, we have a problem. Worse and worse. They wanted us to wake up. And they wanted her to be the sergeant. She didn't want to wake up and be the sergeant. The sergeant was thankless. They didn't pay you very much more. When something went wrong, you were the one that had to fix things. Responsibility was lousy. Sarge. On the other hand, if you didn't see things were done right, it'd get done badly, and watching the resulting inefficiency was like being poked repeatedly in a sore tooth. It galled at her. Besides, if she didn't get up, Murray would be in charge, and he hadn't done anything bad enough to deserve that. She opened one eye. Algol was shake, uh, shaking her shoulder. Oh, no. Oh, that didn't sound right. She paused, licked her lips, tried again. Her mouth was dry. Yes, Corporal. Sarge, uh, we, we, we have a problem. Of course they had a problem. Everybody always had a problem. There was a war on. She sat up. Where's the battle? We don't seem to be there anymore, Sarge. Don't seem to... Most of the 19th was sprawled on the ground. Murray was on the other side of what looked like a small clearing in the woods, except they'd been on a hillside, not in the woods. Where did the woods come from? Did those trees grow while I was asleep? Algol considered this dutifully. I think they usually take a bit longer than that, Sarge. Is the battle over? Did you carry me back the way we came? Algol shook his head. I, I just woke up, Sarge. Murray came over, folding up a little glass and brass contraption in his hands. We're not at the battlefield. Thank you, Corporal Obvious, said Nasilka, ignoring that she had said something similar about 30 seconds before. <coughs> no, Sarge, you don't understand. We're not anywhere near the battlefield. We're miles off. There's a break in the trees over there. I got a sighting on a mountain. I think it's Goblin Home. Well, that's fine then, said Nasilga. I mean, Goblin Home. Sarge, it's at least 50 miles away. We're on the wrong side of it. 
she considered this. The seaside. The human side, Sarge. Sergeants don't scream. They shout at people quite a lot, but they do not scream. Nasilka took a deep breath and let it out cautiously. She didn't scream. Okay. That was fine, then. So, what you're saying is we're behind enemy lines. Murray laughed. There was a slightly hysterical edge to it. <laughs> Sarge, we'd have to move about 40 miles up just to be behind enemy lines. We're practically behind the enemy nation. Ah. There was a long moment while Murray fiddled with his glass and brass thing, and Algol stared up into the trees where Nasilka's mind was an absolute blank. She was a sergeant by virtue of always being the responsible one. She had the same two weeks of boot camp as everybody else. At no point had they covered what to do when you were accidentally whisked into the heart of enemy territory. Still, you had to do something. All right, she said, finally. Murray, I'll go get everybody awake and on their feet. Check for wounded. See who came with us. They saluted and peeled off. The Silka got to her feet and looked around. It wasn't a bad forest. Other than the fact that they were absolutely not where the other than blah. other than the fact that they absolutely were not supposed to be there, it was actually a perfectly nice forest. It was deep and green, and the ground was covered in a soft mat of some little plant or other. The spots under the trees were deep with pine needles and leaf litter. Birds were calling from the canopy. The branches whispered and shifted gently in the wind. It was a nice forest. It had probably belonged to goblins once. It was a shame they couldn't stay here for a bit. She sighed. Up in the trees, the crow went, Ark! and the call seemed to hang in the air for a very long time. Everybody's up, Sarge, said Murray. Nobody's bad hurt. Blanchett's got a twisted ankle. Need to check something? Oh, yes. He says I can walk on it, said Blanchett, nodding to the teddy bear. Probably not a full march, though. Tell him thank you. Said Nasilka absently. <coughs> About two thirds of the winded Niners had come through the hole in the air with her. Algol, Murray, Blanchett, Thumper, the recruits. Oh, God's the recruits. Plus Gluber, who had always had a finger in some orifice or other. <laughs> and Weasel, who was tiny and slender and of completely indeterminate gender, and who started when you tried to talk to, for lack of a better word, her. Nasilka was pretty sure she was a girl, but if Weasel wasn't going to say anything about it, neither was she. Everybody else was back at the battlefield. Uh, we, uh, we found the wizard, too, said Algol. Oh, dear. The wizard was in a lot worse shape than any of them. He was still unconscious, his breathing was shallow, and his skin was grey. Now, this would have been normal in a goblin, but he was one of the pinkish humans, so it probably wasn't a good sign. He had a thin, worried face and badly bitten fingernails. He didn't look like a lunatic killing machine, but then, who did? There didn't seem to be any marks on him, and Nasilka was pretty sure she hadn't run into him that hard. It's probably the magic, said Murray, but he was trying to cut and run. That thing in the air was an escape route. Maybe it takes energy to go through it, and when we all fell through it, it knocked him out. What do we do with him now? asked the recruits meekly. The 19th all looked at each other while carefully not meeting each other's eyes, which is actually a really neat trick. Nasilka sighed. They ought to kill him. They all knew they ought to kill him. He was the enemy. He was a wizard. He probably killed a lot of goblins shooting that blue stuff out of his face. He'd kill them all if he had a chance. The problem was that it's one thing to kill somebody when they're charging at you with a sword or shooting blue things from their face, but it's an entirely different thing to kill somebody who's lying unconscious on the ground. The one is just war. It was like that. This, though, this felt like murder. Now, goblins are nasty and smelly and grumpy and have bad attitudes, but they are not inherently bad. They're pretty much like everybody else. 
They don't kill people for fun, regardless of what the propaganda posters say. And this guy was a wizard, and wizards were scary, but you had to feel a little sorry for them too. They probably hadn't wanted to wake up one day with the power to unmake the world. And the Silga shook her head. We're not going to kill him. Everybody relaxed, imperceptibly. We can't tie him up, though, Murray pointed out. When he wakes up, if he gets his hands or his mouth free, he could, you know, magic us. So we better be a long way off when he wakes up, then, said Nasilka. Everybody, get ready to move out. Fumper, cut a crotch for Blanchett. Gluber, get your finger out of there. Algol, do we have any blankets? No, Sarge, we, we don't have much. Nobody took their full kit into the battle. Murray's got some mechanical stuff in his pack, and I've got a rope. But beyond that, it's basically whatever we've got on our backs. And our field kits. The standard issue goblin field kit is a pocket knife, two bandages of dubious cleanliness, a rubber band, a stump of candle, some dried fruit, and a book of matches. It fits into the standard issue tin cup, which then fits into a small pouch. It was better than nothing, but not by much. If I cannibalize a couple of things, Murray patted his pack, which caused everyone to brace briefly for an explosion. Can probably rig another travel stove. We'll be able to cook anyway. Does anybody have a bow and arrow? Nobody did. Archers were another unit entirely. The 19th was strictly hand to hand. Weasel put up a hand shyly. Oh, I don't have Weasel yet. This is great. Yes, Private? I. Weasel turned bright red. Nasilka put an arm around the small goblin's shoulders and turned her around so that the eyes of the troop weren't on her. In your own time, Private. I can use a sling, Sarge. Good. We might actually eat after all. We're almost ready, Sarge, said Algol. Blanchette was experimenting with his crutch under the watchful eye of the teddy bear. Nasilka looked down at the wizard. No blankets. She was going to miss it tonight, but she pulled her cloak off and laid it over the wizard. Poor Sod was probably in shock, and if he didn't stay warm, he was as good as having killed him. Besides, he was a wizard. They had a hard time fending for themselves. Algol, see if you get look, can get a little water into him before we go. I'd rather not leave a trail of dead bodies behind us. Algol nodded. Everybody else, I want to get at least five miles away from here, and then we're looking for a place to roll up for a bit that's hidden and defensible. And let's try... Not to leave a trail like a wounded moose, all right? I was just saying that suck your teeth thing is the most British thing to Silk has done so far. Well done. No one deserves her. I love the Silk. <coughs> Chapter 9. It was a beautiful day in the forest. The birds were calling. The birds were calling a lot. Zilka was getting a feeling that wherever they, whatever they were calling was probably the ornithological... <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let's start that from the top, shall we? <laughs> One more time, just with less suck. <clears throat> Seriously, the best direction I've ever seen, and this was in a professional audio production, was, Chaps, that was very good, but could we try it again with less acting? <laughs> it was a beautiful day in the forest. The birds were calling. Birds were calling a lot. The silka was getting a feeling that whatever they were calling was probably the ornithological equivalent of, Come and get a load of this! Travelling through thick woods with a troop of goblins is not unlike a nature hike with a group of grumpy toddlers with weapons. They fell into things. <coughs> <coughs> they fell out of things. They attacked bushes. The bushes frequently attacked back. They startled small animals who startled them badly in return, causing them to fall into more bushes. They stepped on things that were not good to step on and stepped on things that squelched or stank or exploded with spores. Sergeant Nasilka watched as her troop discovered a patch of poison oak and had to look away. Blanchette stumped up beside her, leaned on his crutch, and eyed the rest of the troop. He says that's poison oak they're rolling in, he informed her, pointing to the teddy bear. I think he's right. 
Murray emerged from the thicket, holding a sprig of leaves at arm's length. Leaves of three, Murray was muttering. Leaves of three. Gods, everything has three leaves. How do you tell? If you touch me with that, Corporal, I will have you court-martialed. Yes, Sarge. They rounded up the now very itchy troop and staggered on. <laughs> How far do you think we've come, Murray? Maybe a mile, Sarge. Probably no much more than that. We lost some time when Luba stepped on that wasp nest. A tree had apparently offended Thumper in some fashion. He attacked it with his maces. And then with his teeth. Algol, go rescue that tree. Luba, if you've got poison ivy on that. <laughs> <coughs> Let me try that again. Algol, go rescue that tree. Luba, if you've got poison ivy on that finger, you are going to regret sticking it in there. Weasel, whoa. Weasel turned scarlet and mumbled something. Is that a pheasant? <coughs> I made a sling, Sarge. She held out the strip that in a former life had been a section of rancid goat hide loincloth. Slung over her shoulder was a very large, very dead bird, nearly as big as the little goblin's torso, and sporting a gorgeous rainbow of feathers. Thank you. I I, I thought Weasel, remind me to put you in for a medal when we get home. Bird tonight! Can you catch another one? The little goblin mumbled and shrugged and stared at her toes. Do your best. Make someone else carry the bird. Sarge, there's a break in the trees up ahead. Murray was already digging in his backpack. Permission to go scout the land. Permission granted. What, what do you call that contraption anyway? What, the lucky tube thing? Yeah, the lucky tube thing. Oh, oh, that gets me. <coughs> I'm, I'm going to try that again, just with less giggling. Permission granted. What do you call that contraption, anyway? What, the lucky tube thing? Yeah, the lucky tube thing. Ask a stupid question. Yeah, go get the lay of the land. Everybody take five. Glue, but I warned you about that finger. Murray returned in about ten minutes frowning. Algol supervised the application of mud to scrapes, stings and welts. The silker was mentally composing a report to the Goblin High Command, detailing the need for wilderness survival training for the troops. Heading 1. Poison Oak. Identification of. What's the good word, Murray? Murray chewed on his lower lip. Not much of one. We're on the west edge of a pretty substantial forest. Runs a fair way. Curves around to the north, so if you follow the edge, we'll get closer to Goblin Arm. But we won't get there very fast. What about striking out from the forest? I wouldn't recommend it, Sarge. It's all farmland out there between us and home. Absolutely flat for a long way, practically right up to the foothills. At least 30 miles of farm, 20 more of hills. You or I could make it in a couple of days, but with this crew... He spread his hands in an eloquent gesture that expressed... Rather better than words, the general competence of the Wayne and Niners at anything resembling stealth. Better part of a week in the open, with cornfields and edgerows for cover. You know I'll follow you anywhere, Sarge, but I think it's suicide. Heading two. Moving stealthily. Practice thereof. And if we follow the forest? Probably closer to 50 or 60 miles, although it's hard to tell. Could be more. We'll still have an open bit at the end. Can't tell if the woods go to the foothills, but I don't think they do. But we'd be under cover most of the way. The silka nodded. She had a brief vision of herding the 19th across open fields by night, hiding in drainage ditches during the day. Barking dogs. Men with crossbows. I'm thinking we'll go with your plan. One more thing. There's a town, probably ten miles north, real close to the woods. We could probably go deeper in and go around it and risk getting lost. But we might want to try raiding it. Raiding? Corporal, there are nine of us. Nine goblins on a good day could 
probably disrupt a child's tea party or decimate a chicken coop, but Nasilka wouldn't have put them against anything bigger. I'm not suggesting we try to pillage the town, Sarge. I'd in mind more hitting an N house or maybe somebody's laundry. Have you seen Thumper's loincloth? <laughs> Thank you. I have been trying not to look. There's a couple of isolated farmhouses on the outskirts. I think a small group could raid one. I've no stomach for killing farmers, Murray. And if we do, we're going to have hunters after us before you can say... Gluck. Great gods, no, Sarge. I'm hoping they won't even see us. She relented. <coughs> All right. Talk to me again when we find a place to hold up for a bit. But I'm still hoping to put miles between us and that wizard. In the end, they found a kind of dirt cave and a mostly dried out riverbed. If it rained, they might flood out, but the promise of even a muddy pool of water nearby was more than enough to recommend the campsite. They had made at least three miles, which wasn't as much as Nasilka liked, but it wasn't nothing. Weasel had managed to bring down a rabbit. A rabbit and a bird weren't much between nine people, but along with the dried field rations, it wasn't bad, and everybody knew it could have been a lot worse. Both rabbit and pheasant were cooked on a spit, and were greeted with so much, so many ab ah. Both rabbit and pheasant were cooked on a spit, and were greeted with so many appreciative complaints. God, tough as an old shoe. You call this rabbit? Looks like a long-eared ferret. Tastes like one as well. What was this bird eating? Stink bugs. Though the little goblin was completely tongue-tied. All right, fellas. Tomorrow we're doing a full day's march. Said Nasilka once the last bones had been gnawed. Groans greeted this. She waved them off. We've got a route back to Goblin Home, but we're sticking to the woods for now. How far are we from Goblin Home, Sarge? About 50 miles as the crow flies. We're not crows, though, so we're looking at 70 or 80. More groans. Why can't we take the short way? Because it's through human farmland, and I don't think they'd be really happy to see us. Oh, I don't have Gloober either. This is great. Perhaps we could go in disguise? Asked Luba, hopefully. We are four feet tall and green. I think they're going to notice. Blanchett consulted with his teddy bear for a few minutes and then said, He says it's a good plan, Sarge. The teddy bear had one of the pheasant tail feathers stuck behind one ear, giving it a jaunty look. Uh, great. Thank him for me. Nasilka wondered briefly what she'd have done if the teddy bear hadn't approved, had a brief vision of a mutiny led by a one-eyed stuffed animal, and squelched it. It had been a long enough day already. It was a long night, too. Goblins are good at sleeping on the ground. They'd all been doing it for so long that they hardly cared anymore. Pack for a pillow, cloak if you had one, and tonight they had the luxury of cut pine bows for a mattress, which was significantly better than camping on the hillside. No one was complaining there. No. The problem was the noises. Generally, the noises of goblin digestion, snoring, and other indelicate processes were enough to drown out anything outside. This time, however, the gurgle of nine stomachs had nothing on the woods. Those aren't normal, said Thumper. The fourth or fifth time something went by with a swoosh outside, as if on enormous wings. It's owls, said Murray. It's not owls said Thumper. I am a forest goblin, okay? Those are not owls. Can't have been in the forest since you were little, said Murray. They haven't changed owls since I was a child. Owls are silent. They sneak up on stuff. That's not an owl. As if exhausted by speaking this many words all at once, he fell silent. Everybody listened. Something that Probably wasn't an owl, whooshed by again. We don't like this, Sarge, said Mishkin and Mushkin. Sarge doesn't like it either, said Nasilka, but it's out there and we're in here and it'll have to come through me to get to you, so go to sleep. She was closest to the entrance of the cave and she'd always had pretty good hearing. She was probably the only one who could hear the other noise. 
the soft, sucking sound of footsteps in mud as something walked quietly up the riverbed, fifteen or twenty feet away. She glanced behind her. Murray was the next closest, but he was half deaf from his time in the mechanics corps and the explosions. She didn't say anything. A hand tight on the handle of the club, Sergeant Nasilka stared wide-eyed into the dark. Sings to trees, in the meantime, stood on his porch, a cup of tea in one hand, and frowned. He wasn't particularly scared of the dark. He knew most of what lurked in it. He'd occasionally remove thorns from their paws, and although he was careful never to rely on it, he was fairly certain that there was an understanding among the smarter denizens of the forest that he and his farm were a little bit off limits. He suspected he'd been lumped in with the little birds that picked the teeth of crocodiles, something too useful to eat on a whim. For the predators that went on two legs, there were always the trolls. A desperate man had come to the farm once, and he'd been much more desperate after the trolls got him cornered on the roof, and the gargoyle sat on his head. He'd been positively grateful to see the rangers when they came to take him away. Seeing as the trees had lived out here for years, more or less by himself, and never had any particular cause to fear the dark. Still, there was something odd about the dark tonight. The elf wrapped his fingers in Fleabane's ruff. The coyote whined briefly. He must feel it too. Seeing as the trees wished he could put his finger on it, the crickets all sang the usual songs, the fireflies had been out in force through the evening, the spring peepers had mostly stopped peeping, but there was nothing more sinister than the season passing. Early cicadas had begun to take their place. It wasn't too quiet. It was a healthy forest at night, so it was downright bloody noisy. The stars were in the usual positions, the leaves were hissing the way that leaves always hiss in the wind. And still, something was making him uneasy. Fleabane sighed and flopped against his shins. The coyote's hackles kept coming up, then easing back down. Sings to trees knew exactly how he felt. The leaves sighed, the crickets chirped. A lone firefly, still lovelorn, flashed its message to any other fireflies that might be looking for a good time. The bone deer picked their way across his memory, attracted to mystical disturbance. Hmm. He wondered what a mystical disturbance looked like. He hoped it didn't feel like this. On the roof, the gargoyle mumbled something deep in its chest, a gravelly sound of unease. Fleabane whined again. A leaf insect made its way slowly across one of the porch pillars, its body shadowy green in the light from the doorway. Sings to trees watched it pick its way along one spindly leg at a time until it was out of sight. Still, nothing had happened. Still, the cricket sang. The gargoyle paced back and forth across the roof, and eventually, for lack of anything better to do, Sings to trees went inside and barred his door against the dark. And that's where we'll leave that for the week. Ooh, <coughs> spooky. Ominous spooky. Let me just make a quick note. <laughs> Jotting down accent notes for... Gloober, Andy Sandberg. There we go. There we go. Sandberg, <laughs> annoyed by contractions. Annoyed by contractions is not an accent. <laughs> How about a break, everybody? We've been going uh, a little more than an hour now, and it's Pop-Tart time, I'm thinking. So we're going to cut away and take a break for a couple of minutes. Just as a reminder, we always do a countdown when we come back. So if you don't see a countdown on the screen, you've got at least 60 seconds. Um, take a chance to refill your drink. Uh, if you've got a drink that was hot, maybe make sure it still is. Uh, attend to any medications, pets, snacks, all that good stuff. And we'll be back in a couple of minutes.
and we're back. Pop tarts have been consumed, or in my case, at least they have been consumed. Well, they're in, mine's in process still. There we go. It's time for shenanigans. And I have updated my accent list. Have you? <laughs> yes, I tell, have. Tell everybody the fun notes. <laughs> Thumper, annoyed by contractions. Posh, flat. Gluba, Andy Samberg. Oh, no. Oh, dear. <coughs> And the note, yeah, <coughs> the note, oh dear. I, note I have for magical t uh, textbooks reads simply, Trexel. <laughs> <laughs> the poking is to cease. I love it. <coughs> I love it. <coughs> <coughs> you okay? Mm-hmm, I'm all good. So. Hang on just a second. I'm not looking at the screen. I'm sorry. I'm okay, tweeting. I'm just going to vamp. Hang on a second. I'm finishing my tweet. That means so badly. Um, <laughs> Go. You're good. So now we come to the final stage of the evening's festivities, which is shenanigans. Hang on a second. If I was really on top of things, I would have changed that. Okay, say that again. So now we come to the final section of the, the night's festivities, which is shenanigans. See? Doesn't that look totes profesh? That looked totes profesh. Late, and, but totes profesh. It's all good. It and, is uh, time for some nonsense. Time for some foundering. And this week we're taking a slightly unusual approach to shenanigans. Most of the time, it's Magnus Archives related content. This week, it is... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think you need to set the stage for this. For those of you who were with us in the stream a couple of months ago, was it a couple of months ago? In the before time, in the long, long ago. Sometime around April 300th of 2019. When the delightful Matt F. and Wallace joined us. You have some context for this. For the rest of everybody, please describe Mr. Wallace. Matt Wallace is a six foot five former professional wrestler who used to teach unarmed combat techniques to soldiers. He is the kind of person who, one life to the left, when John Wick sneaks into the nightclub, in the original John Wick, he go, you working tonight, Matt? Yes, sir. Take the night off, Matt. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that bouncer, that could be Matt Wallace. Yes. Absolutely. He looks terrifying. He is the epitome of human teddy bear. He is. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. And his wife, Nikki, is my sister from another mister. Yes. Um, she's, in fact, your, your SoCal twin, isn't she? She is my SoCal sister. Absolutely. <coughs> I am NorCal. She is SoCal. We meet in the middle, and there is Jamba Juice, and it is glorious. <coughs> Pardon me. You doing okay? I'm doing good. He says, coughing again. Dog pond, perfect, nailing it here with statement of Matt Wallace regarding pain, humiliation, vandalism, and retail theft. Yes, this is absolutely um, what's about to happen. Matt is, is a lovely human being and a fiercely talented author, and we'll be throwing up some links to some of his best books in the show notes. Um, and Matt also, I think largely because for a very long time he was in a profession which was made entirely of ego, an entirely a presentation, has no front. This this is a man who's who is defined by fierce, relentless honesty. And when things go wrong for him, as for all of us, every now and again, they go thrilling levels of wrong. I mean extraordinary levels of wrong. <coughs> this is one of those stories. Well done. Excellent segue. Thank you. Hey, who's up for a relatively low stakes tale of pain, humiliation, vandalism, and retail theft involving me that is absolutely 99% my wife Nikki's fault? And if she tells you any differently, she is a liar! It's story time. Please mute if you hate long stories. So, Nikki and some of her friends in her office are trying to eat a little healthier at work, and in said effort, they alternate preparing and bringing in breakfast and lunches for each other. It is a good thing. And I support it. Today was supposed to be one of Nikki's days, and we meant to food prep for it yesterday. Got all the stuff at the beginning of the weekend. Sunday came, and we didn't do it. 
The reasons may be erotic in nature. It's unimportant to the story. Nikki said she'd just buy them all lunch today and with apologies and no big deal. Fine, except I couldn't sleep last night. So around 4am, I was wide awake in bed and decided, screw it. I'm a nice guy. I'll get up and make all the food for them. Yay me, right? So I prepare all the makings for Big Mac salad, which is one of my specialties. It's a salad that tastes like a Big Mac, as should be evident by the name. We use sugar-free Thousand Island dressing. It's a good time. Breakfast is supposed to be egg white muffins. The plot twist is coming. Egg white muffins involve mixing up egg whites with various ingredients, pouring those ingredients into a muffin tin and baking them. Simple. I dice up jalapeno. Jalapeno, you see that? Yes, because in this country, they say jalapeno, and pino is a wine. Pino is a pepper, and it makes me angry every single time. I have heard people over here refer to them as jalapenos. <laughs> I dice up jalapeno, cilantro, onion. It's all going smoothly. <coughs> time to mix everything together and pour it in the muffin tin. Only, where is our muffin tin? We must have one, yes? This was Nikki's plan. Nikki is a baker. What is a baker without muffin tins, I ask you? But I cannot, for the life of me, locate one in our kitchen or garage. I call my mother-in-law. It's now like 5.30 in the morning, but she's awake. Do you have a muffin tin I can borrow? You already borrowed it. Oh, we didn't bring it back? Approximately nine million years of listening to her searching her kitchen later, and apparently no. No, we did not. What happened, dear reader, is every year after we do our taxes, something in the house breaks. It's more than a tradition. It's an inescapable curse. We angered or slated some warlock and can never make amends. This year, immediately after taxes, our stove shat itself. <coughs> <coughs> so we purchased a new one, had it delivered, installed, the old stove carted away. Neither Nikki, for whom baking in this household is almost sole province, and who put the goddamn thing there, nor I remember to check the old stove storage. Where the elusive muffin tin was. Goodbye, Nikki's mom's muffin tin. Maybe you were salvaged by someone at the stove recycling. Maybe you're gestating muffins to their delicious, cakey fruition at this very moment in a new household. A more attentive household. I hope so. Anyway. So I have all this stuff prepped, but no muffin tin. I decide no big deal. No big deal. I'll run to Ralph's and buy a new one. They're open. They're just around the way. There won't be anyone there this time of morning. This will take me five minutes. It was meant to be a simple errand. Mask up, run inside the store, grab a muffin tin, back before the cilantro starts to lose its vibrancy. I didn't even pop the cutting board in the fridge. I was going to be that quick about it. <sighs> quick quiz, folks. That was totally dramatic tea in case you all missed it. What do you do after you dice up hot peppers? What do you do no 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 you have to do that in the bad guy from speed voice what do you do what do you do after you dice up hot peppers what do you do what is the Thank one you. very important personal grooming step you should always take after handling the innards and seeds of very hot peppers especially before leaving the house did we mention there are content warnings for this let me put those in the chat again, just one more time. So yeah, I'm as I'm turning into the Ralph's parking lot, I rub my right eye. Just a little. I admit it, I violated the holy pandemic tenet of touching one's face, and I did it at the worst possible moment. I rubbed all the fiery essence of several peppers right into my eyeball. It wasn't that bad at first, folks. And it wasn't my first rodeo with a capiscum ocular mishap. The, the phrases like capiscum ocular mishap are why I love Matt Wallace. Capsicum. Capsicum, os ocula capsicum. capsicum oscula ocular mishap. That's a band name. And now capsicum oscula ocular mishap with crazy gods of endless noise. 
It certainly couldn't be any worse than the time Nikki did the same thing with her hands in my penis, right? True story for another time. I figured, hey, I'll power through it. The confidence with which I strode inside that relves, my friends, the sheer unadulterated hubris. I'll blink it out, I thought, because I am the opposite of smart. I barely touched it. The peppers weren't even that hot. I'll be fine. I didn't even go to the cook aisle. I began to browse. Oh, hey, we all sent in cucumbers. Let me check those out. How do you tell if a cucumber is ripe? Do you squeeze it? Let me squeeze it. It feels sort of like one of those rubber balls in the bin at Target. What does that mean? <coughs> As I am having this dialogue with myself concerning the life cycle of the English cucumber, I begin to sweat. Just a little into my right eye. And as the sweat hit my eye, the air hit the sweat hitting my eye, and my brain began to scream a banshee wail of pain, hitherto unknown. It was excruciating. I could not open my eye at all, lest the very air we breathe stab my pain centers with a thousand tiny swords. And keeping my eyes shut was like trying to restrain an angry toddler, punching the inside of my eyelid with spiked knuckles. I start to panic. I can feel my eyes swelling as it continues to throb in agony. I am now pouring with sweat. My monkey brain assures me that I will have to come out now, as surely there is no recovering from trauma such as this. I am standing in the middle of Ralph's doubled over. At that point, a voice much smarter than mine that somehow existed in my own head mentioned a very interesting fact. Hey, you know what supermarkets usually have in general abundance? Milk. That may be relevant to your current interests. <coughs> For those in the chat who aren't aware milk is one of those things you're supposed to drink when you eat hot food milk yes i hobble sprint to the dairy freezer attempting with one eye to locate the smallest container of milk available why are there so many dairy products and why do they all have white labels will half and half work is skim too weak does sour cream count as milk i settle on a pint bottle of whole and literally crawl along the adjacent wall to the nearest restroom sign Honestly, my whole head is numb by this point. I lock myself inside one of the singles restrooms. I think it was the men's, but fuck your binaries, especially at the moment, you know? <coughs> <coughs> A quick aside. Very little peeled my brain more when I lived in the US than the realization that you have in-progress shopping restrooms. There's this thing we have in the US. It's called space. I was literally expecting you to go, there's this thing we have called freedom. No, 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 I wouldn't say that. But w w especially in California, there's land. And when you have land, you can do convenient things like bathrooms. Oh no, UK supermarkets have bathrooms. They just have them after the tills. There is no peeing while you're shopping. You could shoplift. Get back to the story. Okay. In America, you can wee anywhere. Very true. Curveball. I try with trembling hands and limited vision to open the milk. People have been opening milk for as long as milk has been bottled. How fucking hard can this be, right? This is a caveman task. Brute strength. I'm great at those. Only, my friends, only this milk bottle, see, this milk bottle was uncircumcised. There was plastic foreskin completely covering the gap. Why? And I could not pry this plastic away to save my life or my eye. It is worth noting at this point, and as several of you, including Ursula V, have already pointed out, this is all happening while I am standing next to a sink, utterly filled with running water. And listen, I don't claim to be a master strategist, okay? My reptile brain hissed, milk, and that was the only solution it would accept in that moment. So I attempted to solve the worst Nickelodeon's Legends of the Hidden Temple challenge ever, the way I usually solve most of my problems, by using a knife, which I generally carry with me. Now, many of you will say, Matt, you should have used your knife to cut away the obstructing plastic. And yes, you are correct. I had formulated an alternate plan, however, and oh boy, did I think I was MacGyver in that panicked moment. Let me tell you. My plan was thus. 
puncture the center of the plastic milk bottle with my knife very, very delicately, just enough to allow me in a highly controlled and professional manner to squirt small amounts of milk from the bottle into my injured eyes and eat it. Simple, elegant, effective. And in Matt's defense, <coughs> cinematic? I mean, I'm sure his movie script writing brain went straight there. You can practically see that scene in an episode of MacGyver. Can he's, you? he's basically shotgunning the milk at this point. Yeah. I wish to reiterate several key factors before pressing on. One, I was still in an immense amount of pain. Two, everything I am describing occurred in a matter of seconds. Three, this plan made perfect sense to me at the time. Your Honor. Here is the good news. The puncturing of the milk bottle went well. I'm a fair hand with a blade, I am. The hole was small, the leakage was controlled and contained. The surgery was a smashing success. Here is the not awesome news. To successfully complete the second phase of my plan, I was required to manually and delicately squeeze the milk out of the bottle through the surgical hole I had just made in said bottle. Here are the instructions my brain gave my hand. Please apply minimum pressure to the bottle you are holding, just enough to engage a thin stream of its liquid contents. Here is what my hand heard. Hulk smash! Hulk smash! Hulk smash! Cross bottle like skull of enemy smash! Oh, semi-important information. By this point in the restroom, I had removed my shirt because it seemed like a good idea before dousing my face with milk. <coughs> <coughs> so, there is me. Naked to the waist, eye pulsing and swollen to the size, colour of an sun-ripened tomato, craning backward over the sink of a Ralph's bathroom, head tilted like Jennifer Beals. <laughs> Like Jennifer Beals on the post of a flash dance as I turn the bottle held above my face into a milk grenade. <laughs> it fucking exploded everywhere, all over me, all over the bathroom. And listen, I can make any number of colourful ejaculatory jokes metaphors here, but I'm not going to, but this is a story of human error and suffering, and it is serious <laughs> literature. You have to understand, in that moment, I didn't even care about the wreckage I just caused. My singular mission was still... <laughs> Oh, my singular mission was still milk in hurty eye only. That was it. That was my everything. There was still milk in the bottle. At the bottom, I could feel it. I could sense it. I only had to pry the already half-destroyed bottle open from the middle. <coughs> <coughs> Which I did. Which made no sense because I could have just poured it out normally. I will not be taking questions. So I pour several tablespoons of milk directly into my eyeball and then toss the shredded bottle away like an empty artillery shell. And did I feel the relief I had sought through pain and adversity? <sighs> not really. I mean, kinda, maybe. It was sort of better, I guess. At this point, inevitably, I'm sure you'll agree, there came a gentle knocking at the bathroom door. A voice beyond the door, no doubt the source of the knocking, did not wait for a reply to said knocking, and spoke to me thusly. Sir, you're, uh, you're not allowed to take things from the store into the bathroom. And indeed, I had noticed a sign upon entry out of my single functioning eye, informing potential bathroom users products were not allowed in the bathroom. I assumed some policy would make allowance for emergencies. Perhaps I had chosen to ask forgiveness rather than permission. At this point, I was finally able to take a step back from things and assess my situation. Here's what I came up with. I was a six foot four, 380 pound, half naked man in gym shorts, covered in milk, with a swollen red eye, who had just destroyed a bathroom I did not own. Now, how to remedy this situation? Again, my reptile seized upon the simplest and most actionable answer. Lie to this person who cannot see you. Clean yourself up and clean the bathroom up and leave the store as briskly as possible. No one will ever know. 
Perfect plan. Bathrooms are made for cleaning. I just need... Yes! There it is. An automatic paper towel dispenser. It operates on sensors. <laughs> like in the future. It is like paper towels in space. I feel like Buck Rogers every time I use one. And Wait, why, why aren't they coming out? No paper towels, friends. None. I wanted to scream. Am I trapped in a goddamn sitcom? Fine. Toilet paper. Not ideal, but workable. It's encased in some fucking heavy-duty Faraday cage bolted to the wall. But surely an end is poking out somewhere shortly. No! <sighs> All the while, I had not answered the individual on the other side of the door. A fact that had not gone unnoticed by them. Sir, gentle, probing, unassuming, maybe a little suspicious, but aren't we all in this world of malice and cruelty and inscrutable human nature? <coughs> I had, uh, I began, more unsure of myself than I'd been since I was a very small child, understanding of the world only that I possess no power over it or myself. An emergency! Are you okay? They asked, very genuine concern there, naked and unveiled in their voice. Touching that for a stranger, a potential impediment to their professional life. And how could I answer, friends, except honestly? No, I said. Do you need help? More urgency in their voice now. An urgency that spoke of a readiness to act, to do whatever was necessary, to intervene on behalf of an unseen stranger in distress. I had so much respect for this disembodied individual, their professionalism, their humanity. But their question was much more complicated than the first, because intrinsic in it was, what manner of help do you require? And oh, oh such levels that seemed to me to, to be to that sub-question, seemed I needed so many unrelated varieties of help with so many issues. I didn't know how to answer them. There was no lie I could tell that I could maintain outside the context of a locked door that was sure to be opened at some point in the very near, near, some near point in the future. There was no truth I could tell that would fully encapsulate how I felt in that moment. So, without any further recourse, and without even a tenuous grasp on a possible verbal explanation that would come within a million miles of anything even vaguely resembling coherence, I chose to answer them in the only way that would illuminate the truth they sought. Without another word, I opened the bathroom door. Friends, to describe the look of the be on the face of the beholder I found outside the bathroom, as they only began to absorb what they were witnessing in the thing I had become over the last minute. How... how can I? Have you ever truly realised the awesomeness, the enormity of the universe? It was that. It was a look of uncomprehension. Even as you know, not think, and not believe, and not suspect, or theorise, or ponder but know what you are perceiving is bigger and realer and more fundamental than anything you have yet encountered in your time upon this earth. <coughs> anyway, his name was Albert, and he was very nice. He once squirted Picamus in his eye at a birthday party, so he got it. He got me a towel and said they'd clean up the bathroom. I had to pay for the milk. Small price, really. Epilogue. My eye had begun to shrink and clear, and the pain was much less. I dried myself off, I slouched to the cookware aisle with my destroyed milk bottle, and retrieved a twelve-slot muffin tin, which I purchased. However, upon returning home to my kitchen, to the diced jalapeno that had done me wrong, I realised in my post-trauma haste and malaise, I had in fact grabbed two muffin tins, stuck together, and only paid for one. After all of that, after Albert's grace, I had stolen from Ralph's. I have decided not to return the excess to him. I will pay for it, perhaps leave the money in a thank you card addressed to Albert, but I'll give the muffin tin to Nicky's mom to replace the one we allowed to be spirited away in our stove, thus closing the muffin tin loop. Now in closing, you may ask what I learned from all of this. Nothing. Not a goddamn thing. If the same thing happens tomorrow morning, there is a 99.9% .9 likelihood I will repeat precisely every step I have just painstakingly outlined. I can only be what I am. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. 
Here is a picture of me and my eye in the aftermath of this story in the same Ralph's bathroom just to prove this is a real thing that happened. Oh, and the egg white muffins came out immaculately. God bless. The end. <coughs> we'll include the link to the whole Twitter thread in the, sto- in the show notes and some of Matt's very excellent books, which you should buy. Matt is, is a god amongst men. Oh, he, he bless truly his is. whole entire face. <laughs> Poor guy. I kept. Ex- I have to admit, when he was doing this live, by the time he got to that point, I was convinced he was going to get home and realize he'd forgotten the muffin tins altogether. But I will say, the first time he mentioned, I diced up the onions and the cilantro and the jalapenos. I'm like, you didn't wash your hands. I know exactly where yep. this is going, because <coughs> one of my favorite condiments to make is jalapeno jelly. And I have committed the sin of not washing my hands after dicing jalapenos. Now I wear gloves. I just don't even take the risk. Magnificent human being. Oh. So that's our show. Yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I am delighted to report that we are back on Sunday as my judging uh, duties are, on this stage of them, are dispatched. So Marguerite will be back dealing with whatever the heck this game has become. Immortal, demonic, historic, historic history influencing conspiracies in the council. I think I I I think we're reaching the end of the game, which is good because it's definitely lost its shine with all of these left turns and. It it has become a lot, hasn't it? It has become an lot. That is correct. And we're considering a couple of things for the next thing we stream on Sunday morning, aren't we? Yeah, we've got a couple of different candidates. but if you have suggestions, by all means, ping them our way. And then we'll be back here next Wednesday for the next thrilling installment of Nine Goblins, where I, I strongly suspect my accent list will increase. <laughs> um, Anything else? I think that's it. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Have a lovely time zone, and we will see you next time. Have a good one, folks. Mm-hmm.